Welcome to our worship service this morning. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we're glad to have any visitors that are with us. We are glad to have you here. We invite you to come and be with us again. We also uh, welcome those who join us via the radio broadcast out in the parking lot. We're glad to have you join us for worship as well. A reminder that all of our worship services are video recorded. And they are available through the church website when they're posted earlier in the week. Today is a joyous day when we have six young ladies who are affirming their baptism. Uh, They are saying that they believe in those and will follow those promises that their parents and sponsors made with them when they were baptized. And they uh, commit themselves to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ with their whole lives. So we congratulate them and uh, let them know that you continue in our prayers uh, as you continue your life as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. I call your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. Um, This is the third Sunday after Pentecost as we continue to hear how we as the church live as disciples and witnesses to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Christ is risen. risen Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the Jordan River your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit, and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the third chapter of Genesis. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to, me, to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Here ends the reading. We will now read the psalm responsibly as printed in your bulletin. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to note what is done in this, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. The second lesson is from the fourth and fifth chapters of 2 Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem says, 
he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against himself, itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people were, will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. It's been said many times, everyone's a critic. Sometimes we call such criticism Monday morning quarterbacking. The idea is that it's easy on Monday morning to analyze what the football team did wrong on Sunday. Unfortunately, the best Monday morning quarterbacks tend to be people who weren't involved and were never on the field and didn't know anything about the real situation. Professional quarterback Brett Favre was the target of many Monday morning quarterbacks and their comments over his career. I can only imagine, for example, how often he was told something like, I wouldn't have thrown that pass when someone commented on an interception he had thrown. That is what made Favre's appearance in a MasterCard commercial a few, a few years ago so entertaining. You may remember it. The commercial shows several scenes. In one, Favre walks by a father trying to wipe chocolate ice cream off of his son's white sweater. And Favre comments, I would have gone vanilla with that sweater. Another, in another scene, Favre is filling up his automobile with gas as he watches a guy at a neighboring pump trying to unsuccessfully get the gas hose to go over his car so that the spigot reaches into his tank. To which Favre says, I think I would have parked a little closer. 
as he walks by a hair salon with his wife, Favre sees a woman with an awful and frizzy hairstyle. And he says, whoa, I think. And then his wife cuts him off with Brett and the implied message to not say anything more. And as they walk off, you hear Favre says, what? Walking by a group of city workers who are looking at a geyser of water spraying up into the air, Favre says, I would have looked out for the water main, but that's just me. As, as a lady comes out of the supermarket and her bag holding her grocery splits and the contents fall to the ground, Favre comments, I would have double bagged it. It's easy to see what went wrong after the fact. Unfortunately, all of us have times when we think we can do things better. It happens in congregations, mostly from spectators who will not get involved, but who criticize and carp about everything and how they know and could do it better. But all too often, What's really meant is to bring down someone, to deflect blame from themselves, and to destroy the efforts of those seeking to serve. And it kills ministry, along with any joy and desire to serve. Jesus experienced Monday morning quarterbacking comments regarding his ministry in our gospel lesson for today. And these comments were meant to destroy his ministry. Jesus discovers that these Monday morning quarterbacking experiences were meant to do him in. The first to start in on him was his own family. Jesus had been preaching, teaching, and healing, as were his usual activities. He even challenged the religious people, the scribes, Pharisees, and other religious authorities. And through these activities, Jesus was becoming more popular. People were taking notice, both common people and the religious authorities. But Jesus' earth, earthly family becomes concerned. Having grown up with him, they wonder where he got all this. And they think he is crazy, out of his mind, as many were saying. A mother once said to her son, Every time you're naughty, I get another gray hair. To which the son replied, gee, mom, you must have been a real terror when you were young. Just look at grandma. <laughs> Jesus was giving Mary and the rest of his family gray hairs. They were afraid that Jesus was getting into trouble. And they had come to get him, to stop his ministry, to take him home from some, for some rest. Confirmands, I hope you remember that I emphasized the bedrock teaching of Luther that he got from the Apostle Paul, that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is the key. Without faith, Jesus looks like he's crazy. Those who were troubled by Jesus could not see that he came to bring the grace and life of God. And that led him to speak out against anything that got in the way of God's efforts to save the world. Anything. Only through faith can we see the truth of Jesus. Otherwise, to follow him is just crazy. But in our gospel text, the scribes have their own Monday morning quarterbacking diagnosis of Jesus. These religious authorities had been sent to watch Jesus. 
and to report on his activities. They said that Jesus was possessed by a demon, Beelzebul, also known as Satan, the being who rules over all evil and all demons. They accused Jesus of being Satan and using that power to cast out demons. Jesus calls attention, though, to their folly. Why would a demon want to cast out another demon? Demons would not divide their house, he says. They would not work against one another and fight each other. Once again, the scribes could not see who Jesus was because they did not have faith to see. Now, I have to tell you, Jesus was possessed. But it was not with the unclean spirit of Satan. Rather, it was with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who compelled Jesus to speak the truth of God's will. And this will of God is that everyone might believe, that is everyone might believe in Jesus and come to him. And have a relationship with God through him. So that all might be saved through him. Jesus even went to the cross. Died. And was raised. So that this saving relationship might be available to all who believe. But Jesus goes on to speak the truth as he talks about the unforgivable sin. You see, the truth is, God will forgive anything except one thing. God cannot forgive an attitude that never realizes its own sinfulness or that never seeks forgiveness. This is called self-justification, self-righteousness. The self is good enough. God has provided all grace and eternal life through Jesus, but those caught in self-justification and self-righteousness don't need it. They're just fine on their own without God. Jesus calls this blasphemy, a conscious and willing denial and rejection of God's goodness and grace. And it can happen so easily. Other things just seem more important, and they become priorities for us. They're more attractive than worship and other godly things. You see, it's a matter of choosing our priorities and our commitments. Looking honestly and truthfully at our lives, what are our priorities? What is our priority in the time we spend? What is our priority in how we spend our money? What is our priority in how we worship? Or our priorities in those worldly things rather than making time for God? Writer Bill Reel of the New York Daily News did a story on New York Mets reserve player called Clint Hurdle several decades ago. Hurdle was telling several hundred people sitting in the parking lot of the Salem Evangelical Free Church in Staten Island, New York, of the change that Jesus Christ had brought in his life. Faith in God, he said, had made him a happy man. I dreamed last night I went to heaven, said Hurdle. St. Peter showed me around. He took me into a room filled with clocks. I wondered what all the clocks were for. St. Peter said there was a clock in heaven for everybody on earth, and that when anybody sinned, his clock jumped ahead one hour. I found the clocks of my Christian friends on the Mets, Hurdle continued. There are a lot of Christians on the team. Gary Carter, George Foster, Sid Fernandez, Mookie Wilson, Ron Reynolds, Terry Leach, 
Roger McDowell, Coach Bill Robinson, Manager Davey Johnson, and I began to watch their clocks. Every time one jumped ahead, I'd get self-righteous and say, Gary, I know what you're doing. Or, George, you better get straightened out. I watched their clocks for a while, jumping ahead one hour with each sin. And then a thought occurred to me. I asked St. Peter, by the way, where's my clock? And St. Peter said, we keep your clock in the kitchen and use it for a fan. <laughs> so how's your clock doing? Is it a clock or a fan? Might it be time for confession and forgiveness instead of self-justification and self-righteousness? Mary Sherry, that's her real name, a Minnesota mother, told in Newsweek magazine about her son's need to choose. He had always done well in school, but had always gotten by somewhat chiefly by coasting and flashing a charming smile that went with an equally winsome personality. Most teachers either, either loved it or at least fell for it. Then he encountered Mrs. Stifler for senior English. She called in Mrs. Sherry for a teacher visit. All your son does is sit in the back of the room and chat with his friends, she told the mother. Why don't you move him to the front of the room, asked Mary Sherry. Mrs. Stifler looked at Mary Sherry right in the eyes and said, I don't move, seniors. I flunk them. At first, Mary Sherry was shocked. How harsh! But then as she thought about this driving home, she realized that the teacher was right. She told her son, you have to make a choice. Shape up or she'll flunk you. It's that simple and that hard. She never discussed it further with her son. But English suddenly became a priority for him and he ended the semester with an A. Confirmands, people of God, being a disciple means you have to choose. Saving faith is a gift from God, but we must choose to live in that faith. That is what the warning of blasphemy in the gospel lesson was about. A conscious and willing denial and rejection of God's goodness and grace. Choosing not to live in faith. In his parting sermon to the Israelites, just before they entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua, Moses set a decision before the people. He told them, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live 
loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life for you and length of days. They had to choose life or death. Tatum, Kinsey, Brooke, Hadley, Zoe, Allie. In just a few minutes, you are going to publicly state your decision regarding Jesus. Now you each have already told me that you are ready to confess Jesus as Lord, to affirm the baptismal promises your parents and sponsors made on your behalf, and to commit your lives to live as faithful people of God throughout your entire lives. You have chosen to follow Jesus, and you're going to publicly state that in just a few minutes. But your affirmation of your baptism today is not the end. Because Satan and evil tempt you and want to lure you from God, you are going to have to choose every day. As Moses encouraged, so I encourage you. Choose life by being faithful to God. But it's not just for the confirmands, it's for every one of us. We, every day, must make a choice between God and evil. I encourage you, choose life. Repent and return to God. Every day. That's what Martin Luther said baptism meant for daily living. For those of you who do repent to return to God and choose lives of obedience, I look forward to seeing you in worship regularly. To those who choose not to repent and return to God, I pray you do not wait too long. Because the clock is ticking. Our loving Lord Jesus has enduring titles for those who are obedient and do the will of God. He calls them brother, sister, mother. Though it might seem crazy, God loves us. So much that he gave up his only son to death. And then raised him to life so that we might live as God's people with him forever. May we choose life every day. So that we may be included as brother, sister, mother for eternity. A few weeks ago, in our Old Testament lesson, God asked the prophet Isaiah, Whom shall I send to live and proclaim my word? And Isaiah stood up and said, Here I am, Lord, send me. We heard in our second lesson that we speak as we believe. May you as confirmands, may you as people of God every day confess to God, here I am, Lord, send me. And then may you go out in this holy, the power of the Holy Spirit to live and speak and witness to your faith so that all might be drawn to Jesus so that we might know his eternal life. Amen.
These young ladies have been instructed in the Christian faith and desire to make public affirmation of their baptism. I present Tatum Gore, Kinsey Lundbeck, Brooke Neenstead, Hadley Schultz, Zoe Stahl, and Ali Tiemann. Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these persons, one with us in the body of Christ, who affirm their baptism this day as a sign of their participation in the life of this community of faith. We rejoice that they now desire to make public profession of their faith and assume greater responsibility in the life of our Christian community and its mission in the world. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for Tatum, Kenzie, Brooke, Hadley, Zoe, and Allie, who you made your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlighten them with the gifts of your spirit, and nourish them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants as they affirm the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to this new birth through this holy sacrament. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Sisters in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you members of his church. In the community of God's people, you have learned from, God's, from his word God's loving purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nourished at his holy table and called to be witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Congregation, will you please stand? With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. 